All right, welcome back, everyone. Joining me now via the magic of Zoom is one of the rising stars, really independent of any weight class. It's Adrian, or is it, how, how do you pronounce your first name? Is it Adrian Yanez? Is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Adrian. Uh, yeah, Adrian. Uh, last name is the one that uh, I I make people whitewash a little bit because okay. uh, white people really can't say it. Like the the end, my end, the end is supposed to have an enya, so it's supposed oh, to it be has an enya on it. Yeah, so it's, it's Yan Yet Yan Yez. Yeah, Yan Yez, but yes. a lot of white people can't say it, so I just like yeah. no, it's just just Yanez. Just say Yanez. That's fine. Okay, well, I will, I will, I will say correctly. I'm, I've been taking Spanish for a few years, so it's not. I'm not good at it, but I am at least trying. <laughs> Either way, welcome. I'm very delighted to have you here, Adrian. So, first things first. I see you got a little bit of an injury on your left eye. Give me an injury update. How are you feeling? It was a, it was a dominant win for you, but it seems like you got a little bit of a scrape there. Yeah, no, it was uh, from a headbutt. Like it was like one of a uh, headbutt. We clashed heads like a couple times, but uh, it was like one of the. Uh, it was in transition whenever we started going into the clinch and he, his head rammed into me unintentional, but, you know, still caught underneath, like the, the top of the, the top of his head ended up like catching me right underneath, like the soft spot of my eyebrow and it just split open, you know? Hmm. So uh, that's about it, but I'm about to go to Vegas this coming up week and uh, they're going to get the stitches out and then kind of just see how deep that, like kind of just check out the scar tissue and all that stuff to see how like actual deep the gash actually was. Cause you know, yeah, it was kind of, it was pretty deep. Do you have like a scar tissue issue? I mean, the Diaz brothers are sort of famous for it. Granted, they've been around a long time. You're, you're obviously very young. What is your exact age? If I'm uh, 28, 28, 28. So yeah, you're still pretty young. Do you have a scar tissue problem? Uh, no, honestly, the, this, I actually, I've gotten one on my right eye, but that one is like, after that, like, it was just like, uh, not a, it was kind of minor, but I still had to get stitches. So it was like pretty, like, uh, never opened up again, but this one was a little bit deeper uh so yeah like that one was that that one had to get like uh like it got like five to six stitches but it was like not long it was just very deep in one one yeah. particular spot but no nah, i never never had really any cuts if anything yeah no never had cuts all right well let, let's talk about the fight itself uh it took about 90 seconds for you to feel your way in because I, that's something i want to talk about in just a second mm -hmm. but after that you were kind of off to the races and you almost did whatever you wanted. How would you assess how the fight played out? Man, I feel like it played out uh, exactly how I was, how I was been training. I've been, I was drilling it. The only thing is, is uh, uh, I, I wish it would have played out faster. I wish I would have like, I should have been firing off on all cylinders immediately. Uh, but it took, it took me a second just to even kind of like uh, gather everything together, like seeing like, cause we did we did some film study. I didn't do as much, but my coaches did, and we kind of fired off on everything. Uh, uh, did everything in training camp. We we're trying to make myself fire just immediately, but uh, during during that during those exchanges, I was like kind of like uh, he usually comes a little, a little bit more orthodox, but this one he predominantly came out southpaw, so it was just kind of a little bit weird. So wasn't really able to fire off my jab as much, but like overall assessment, man. Uh, <laughs> I just say like I'm. Yeah, I see, I see a lot of things I could have done better. I see a lot of things <laughs> I definitely could have done better. Like I, I could have made it look a lot more cleaner. But yeah, that's pretty much my whole assessment of it. Like I, I, it went as planned, but it just I could have done it a lot better. Well, I want to come back to the beginning of this fight, but just from a sort of circling through the whole thing, what were you expecting from him? You mentioned the stance, but I mean, in terms of the attacks that you guys had game planned around or thought were like high percentage things he was going to go for, what, what were they? Uh, he, he, we figured whenever you go into the southpaw position, he was going to be th throwing those uh, left kicks, like how he was in that fight. Uh, we, I did, I did expect for him to throw a lot more of those uh, side, those side oblique kicks to the uh, to the front leg in the southpaw position, uh, and I expected him to go orthodox a lot more, and uh, go go low with the low kicks. Uh, his hands, uh, pretty much his hands were just exactly what I expected them to be. Like come straight, not really come back, not really come back, and just kind of keep up a high keep a high guard. Uh, so pretty much like. Uh, those are like the main things we're looking at and plus his blitzes uh he has like a good blitz uh he has a on the back foot he's not great so that's where i wanted to put him at immediately mm -hmm. but uh the front foot whenever he's on uh pushing forward that's where we were like all right cool i need to cut more angles stop stop circling just straight back i need it's either i'm gonna take the take a a u 
or like hit a, hit a little J uh, whenever I'm coming back, instead of just coming back straight back, coming back at an angle instead of uh, coming just straight back and walking to the fence where he's going to want, where he's going to want me. So uh, I should have done that a lot better. I should have hit a harder angle. I should have been hitting harder angle cuts uh, whenever he came in uh, with that blitz, but everything that was in, was in there that, that uh, he threw, I had already expected. Cause we already, we like, leg- my coach literally drilled it in my head. Like we like three, three times a week, we're just drilling, drilling, drilling. Hmm. All right. So one of the big weapons that seem to work out really well for you, it, there's some weapons you go to that are pretty common. I'll talk about those a little bit later, but one of the big ones was you had the circle parry with your hand and then you would mm-hmm. come back and tag him with a hook on the left. Was that something on the fly or was that something that you guys knew was going to be there? I oh, man, I've been doing that. Uh, I've been doing that since uh, back and back at amateurs, back whenever I was an amateur, my coach would, uh, I don't know. I just never like he would, they would, they always say block the kick hit the straight right but it just never felt comfortable for, comfortable to me and i always kind of just wondered what if i just come here and here uh hit the hit the front parry uh parry the kick and come back with the hook and my coach was like oh well yeah well, i like that so since like amateurs I, i've been drilling it so it was like second nature to me and uh hmm. this camp uh we're actually uh like whenever you go to south paul we were just like if he throws that left kick like i should have been like stepping into him while throwing that right hand then throw the hook uh but you know kind of pretty much it just ended up just happening back to like what i've been doing for like my whole entire career off that off that front kick uh usually i do it off whenever people are in the uh orthodox position but since he was uh in the softball position uh, uh i never really have hit it off the softball position but with him throwing it it, was, it just felt really natural for me to throw it and i was like okay landed saw that saw that i could get close with it because i didn't hit him really hit him in the fir- with the first time i did it uh, but I was like, oh, it's there because he would immediately come up to a high guard off that kick. And it was just like pretty, pretty open. Like I knew I wasn't going to be able to hit that straight right because, uh, man, if I would have thrown that straight right, I would either had to either come up underneath and ended up changing it to an uppercut or uh, I'd had to throw overhand. But uh, I just I just wasn't I didn't feel like in the right position at that time. So I just went ahead and parry and. Uh, after that, like I was just kind of leaping into the into the hook, and it was just like, all right, well, that's the one that's gonna work because I saw the big gap in between uh in between that uh right right dead smack when he go into the high guard because he didn't have a tight high guard, he had a little bit kind of a loose uh a loose it was a little bit loose. So I was like, all right, cool. I saw it, saw the opening. I was like, all right, that's the one I'm gonna get him with. Oh, it's an interesting question. I, I, you know, there's this big debate in MMA, like who's the best boxer in MMA, right? And sort of Max Holloway raises his hand. There's a lot of people you could pick. <laughs> You know, so in preparation for this interview, I rewatched all of your UFC fights last night and then some this morning. And I, I at first I was thinking maybe Yanez wa- or Yanez wants to throw his his uh, his his hat in the ring there. But then the more I think about it, you do have a it's it's very curious to me. You have a lot of boxing sensibility to your style. But I wonder, do you see yourself as like a boxer in MMA or do you imagine yourself as something more of a kickboxer? How do you imagine your striking style when you think about it? In what terms do you think about it? Man, uh, on, honestly, like I've always considered myself almost like a boxer puncher type of deal. Like I like ever since like the beginning, because uh, I do like the the feeling of making somebody miss. Like I always like kind of going back to like people like Canelo and all that stuff, like in uh, Floyd Mayweather and all those guys like who like would make you miss and then make you pay for it. That was always like my favorite type to watch. Uh, and then also kind of like watching guys like Julio Cesar Chavez whenever he would just step on the front foot and just be very aggressive, but also keeping a tight defense while moving forward. I always appreciated that. And uh, I kind of just always, I kind of looked at that and tried to replicate it myself. But uh, whenever it comes to the overall style, like I do consider myself more of a boxer puncher in MMA, you know, like uh, I do like taking that front foot. I do like uh, that forward pressure and I do like making people miss so whenever i come back like there's openings uh but also if i get you on the back foot and i can see you just start shelling up and i do love to let my hands go because i start seeing the openings depending on what depending on what they're giving me if they they give me the high guard i absolutely love like going against someone who has a high guard because it gives me a lot more options i can like uh, just like in this fight i wasn't really in the wasn't really even throwing the straight right i was coming around and just like kind of exposing that that left side of his head like with the with the right hook instead of the right straight 
because if I was throwing the right straight, it was going to hit his, it was going to hit his forearm. So I decided to loop it around. Uh, and then also with him coming up so high with the high guard, uh, a lot of these guys in MMA kind of, don't really do well with uh, with the high guard. You know, they don't really know how to drop their elbows. They really don't know how to put themselves in a good position, uh, in, in, in a better position to defend for the body. And, you know, it just leaves it so wide open. And, like, whenever they come into the high guard, it's either they're good. Whenever they drop their elbows just in general, like, for, for the body shot, they always come in and just stay super tight instead of, like, if it's coming around the hook, they leave that whole rib side side exposed. So luckily with Tony Kelly, he just started trying to hollow, hollow out and I was able to find the liver pretty easy. But uh, overall, man, uh, overall, like God, I, I, <laughs> I know I kind of just skated around, just kind of like went all over the place. But I, I, I would consider myself more of a boxer puncher that's in MMA because I do love uh, knocking people out. I do love like going up and just like uh, – how can I say getting the stoppage off of like a beautiful counter? That's my favorite. Are you, it's a fellow Texas guy. Are you a big Errol Spence fan? Cause his body work and the way he manipulates guards in that way, he might be the best in the game at that. Oh yeah, man. Absolutely, man. I, man, I, I would love to see him versus uh, Terrence, uh, Terrence Crawford just because like, fuck, I think that'd be an absolute phenomenal <laughs> fight. Beautiful fight. It would be a beautiful fight. It'd be like, damn, I just want to see that fight. Cause it's going to be like two, uh two technicians who are masterful at 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 boxing just seeing them go at it is going to be like something to behold man like I, I i need that fight but also uh yeah i'm a big fan of errol smith dude i love his body work uh i forget which fight it was but i think it was against uh uh, uh it was some uh latin guy but he, i think he stopped him in the second but they were just going body for body and it was like it was just beautiful to watch uh but yeah no i'm, I'm a big fan of errol and i, I love the body work and I kind of take uh, stuff from boxing. Like I'll legitimately watch like boxing breakdowns to see what I can add to my game to make my body work better. Well, why don't more fighters do that? Because for example, I've noticed a lot of things. And again, I'm, when I say noticed, not like it's some grand revelation, but just things that I see I've been watching MMA a long time. So I get to see things as they develop. And I've noticed the guys, like every style has positives. Every style has negatives, but like backing up straight and leaning, like people don't roll under hooks. And I get that this is not the same as boxing. You have to face a knee and an elbow and all kinds of stuff. So it's not the same, but I have noticed that like the guys who are good at evasion, the guys who have a more boxing sensibility, they can just do a lot more from a lot of different positions. Do coaches discourage this kind of thing? Or, or, or is the only reason like you're good at this is because you have like natural aptitude and you make it a point to make it a part of your game? Why don't we see more of like what you're trying at, at scale? Uh, honestly, I, I would say it's like, cause I try to replicate that as much as I can. I, I try, I try to take what I learned from like boxing videos and like boxing breakdowns also like, cause I kind of grew up also watching boxing. Like my dad was a golden gloves, was a golden gloves boxer. So like mm. coming up, like it was like one of those things that like I was watching boxing. So any, anything else was just kind of just like me, just like wanting to be a boxer growing up, but uh, things didn't plan out, but uh, getting into MMA, uh, my dad would always tell me is like people always like negate the body. They 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 don't really uh, they really don't use their head movement. And they just cover up and thinking that the four ounces are gonna gonna protect them. It was like in boxing, you can you can shell up and like be protected because you got the eights, the tens, depending on what weight class you were in. But and four ounce gloves, if they have the high guard, it's easier to pick that apart. Is there? There's so many more holes. The, the gloves can slip through. I was like, body work should be actually absolutely be a lot easier with the smaller gloves, since like it's just literally just wrapped around your wrapped around your hands, and not something a little bit bigger, not a little bigger object like boxing gloves, like to find the holes. And uh, you know, that's what I do to implement to to what I do. It, it I it try to use what i can to implement into my style like going into the body going in and start manipulating the actual guard itself so uh so so yeah uh when it comes when it comes just overall like everybody in uh mma i feel like they're just kind of like a product of what they're introduced to like like a good good example is uh wonder boy uh, he's brings karate to the to the uh like, cause he was like, that's all he was exposed to just around his own MMA game is just, he was just exposed to karate. If I'm teaching somebody, I'm not going to tell them, I'm like, I'm not going to tell them, uh, like starting from zero, starting from zero from ground up. I'm not going to tell them to do 
uh, karate to for M- like to be successful in MMA. Uh, Wonder Boy pretty much grew up being a karate guy, so it's so much easier for him to implement it and change it for his game into MMA and like make make it work for him. Uh, but somebody coming up from ground level, I wouldn't think they would be able to make that work, especially if like they're just kind of base covered base is like uh, starting someone from 18 with no knowledge of MMA. I would be like, all right, cool. Well, I'm gonna teach you boxing because it's made so much easier to to uh, it puts you in easier position positions to wrestle. And then I would teach them wrestling, the top game, and then also jujitsu just to get up, mm-hmm. more just to get up. So that would be like what I would be showing somebody. But on on my style, it like it was just easy for me to pick up the stuff from boxing because kind of grew up watching it, and I grew up with grew like my dad was also like really big into it so it's easy for me to fall in love with uh with the boxing part of mma you know other than anything else you know it's interesting about your style there's many things that make you a boxer inside mma and th- what i'm about to say by itself would not be that so i'm going to say this in conjunction with everything else but one thing i really notice is you take your time you have a very first round boxing sensibility where it's very much feeling you don't have a ton of offense early it takes you about a minute or two sometimes three to get going and it's it's an interesting way to fight right because in mma everyone wants to be shot out of a goddamn cannon and that can work for a lot of people fair enough but for some it doesn't and what's interesting about you is like you let the guys show you their cards and then you begin to take pieces away and i'm guessing like was this intentional that you had this up front i'm just going to sort of pay attention style or did it naturally evolve that way i a bit of both because whenever i was uh kind of like whenever i grew growing up through the amateur amateur circuit like i was just gung-ho i was like trying to go entire the entire time like my last amateur my last amateur fight you can probably pull it up on youtube i'm just slinging them from like way back like way back and just trying to try and knock the guy out so uh it kind of evolved because like i even like my my pro debut i was like trying to knock the guy's head off every single minute i could uh it kind of took me like to like I got my jaw broken in my second amateur fight. Oh no, not amateur right. My second professional fight. And it kind of made me change my, 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 how I go about things. Like, okay. Like I was kind of like, like I was so worried about offense that my, like my defense lacked and I, I got cracked and you know, fuck, like I, I, I need to clean that up. So I started being a little bit more aware and started working on my defense, started working on being patient. I already had good vision. Like, uh, good vision on seeing things is just like i just wasn't acting on a lot of the stuff even from before i would just be like no i don't care if they're gonna throw the right hand i'm gonna throw my right hand too you know i was like uh i was kind of like uh i thought i was invincible and i was kind of being an idiot you know uh but uh kind of needed i kind of needed to break my jaw <laughs> for for <laughs> me to have that re- relevant uh, revelation of just being like i need to be smarter i need to take my time a little bit more because like i can't rush things and then also too uh, kind of made me start looking at people like uh, uh, Anderson Silva, how he would always take that minute. I like grew up watching him, you know, because I was 15. He, he was at the the streak of, of everything he does. And I remember just watching him at 15 all the way up until after I broke my jaw. And I was like, well, I got to be a little bit more like him because if he's the greatest, he's taking his time. His first his first minute, like there's times that he just circled the whole entire whole entire cage before he would even start even thinking about feigning, start even thinking about like – showing like a jab or a kick or anything and he was just collecting data the whole entire time and and then also even after that jawbreak it started make making me realize that uh people like floyd mayweather like with guy who has some of the best defense just overall like i need to take some lessons out of him because he would give up the first three rounds uh and then after that just take over just see what all you had and just start take over, start taking over start taking away the jab start taking away whatever best weapon you had and just start using it against you and uh, i really uh, appreciate stuff like that and then even now someone like israel adesanya like i love watching them fight because uh everything is like for him it's always it's it's vision and also finding the openings and being defensively aware because man uh, I don't want to be that guy that's waking up to the to the referee being like you're out, you've been out, you're out. So that's always kind of like in the back of my mind. Take, take, like uh, I should have done more fainting, especially in this fight. But I'd like to, uh, especially in the first minute. But I do like to 
analyze the guy while in the middle, while in the middle of my fight, like while everything is kind of going in. Of course, we all do our our film study and kind of just uh, and make our own assessment. But every fight is different. So while I'm in there, I'm going to see like, OK, if he's doing this, he's doing what's he doing? What's he doing this? OK, this is working. Uh, this is not working. I need to adjust to do this. So uh, those those especially those that first minute and minute or two are always kind of key for me to always kind of just analyze and pinpoint and i gotta like thank just me just always kind of just keeping a good eye out like i always had good vision so like i could always like see a jab coming i could always like see like them wanting to throw the right hand because a lot of these mma guys they they have tells they all have tells they they uh and also like also too a lot of guys they're always looking at the face they're always looking at the face while they're fighting i think that's so stupid that's so stupid. Like, I, I don't, I, it just blows my mind. If you're look, if you look at the fighter's chest, you can get a read on everything else even better. Cause if you're going to throw a punch, that chest has to move just very slightly. And you can all, automatically just start like in that split second, you can see like, Oh, he's throwing this. Okay. If he turns just a little bit, I know he's going to throw that right hand. I know if he's going to take that step forward and his, he's going left, left heavy. I know he's going to throw a jab. He's going to throw a hook and you can, and whenever you're throwing a kick, no one's nobody's body is just gonna stay in one spot. They have to turn to, to hit that kick. So it makes it easier for me to like, oh, he's gonna throw this, he's gonna throw this, he's gonna throw that. So uh vision overall is probably the thing that saved me and like kind of like made me change uh like my whole fighting style, especially like right after my second pro fight, because I was an idiot running with my face, you know, running with my face on head on collision every single time. So uh thank you. It, as, as stupid as it sounds, I'm grateful for a broken jaw because it made me realize how how smarter I have to be uh, here. MMA is nothing if not a lesson of or a fight or excuse me, a, a sport of, uh, of hard lessons being learned. But um, one of the things that's sort of very prominent about your style more generally, and you saw it in the Tony Kelly fight that you had last weekend, which is your angles. Jeez, Louise, man, the angles are so good. And here's what I noticed. And, and this was uh, especially true in the Victor Rodriguez fight. I've noticed you'll take angles partly to take the angle right to set yourself on a different position but then often with this with the anticipation that they're going to drift in another direction at which point you will intercept them so with rodriguez that was the head kick that stopped him along the fence line and then tony kelly you knew he was going to move i think it was a left hook you got him whether it was left hook or right hook well, either way mm -hmm. but how, how do you do that how do you set up a situation where i know i have to be over here but i'm going to i'm going to do it to kind of like incentivize them to push them in a certain direction so i can snatch them up at the end like how how difficult is that to do man it is absolutely super difficult like you kind of have to have that like you have to take that front foot and you have to dictate you have to you have to manage the presence like get to like really take the center when you take the center you have to control it and that's that is super hard to do especially in a fight and especially against like tougher opponents and tougher fighters especially people with better footwork uh it's easy it was easier for me especially with uh someone like victor rodriguez because he was like uh he was gung-ho he wanted to come and knock my head off and i knew that immediately as soon as we started the fight and i kind of knew that like if i use my my footwork he wants to take the path of like it looks like the least amount of it looks like the it looks like the least amount of resistance and it looks like the path of least the resistance i show them that like uh, when he was on the fence, I switched to southpaw and it made that gap look so much bigger. But I already knew immediately it was like, I'm sh I'm closing that like I'm closing that door and, you know, knock him, knock him out. And with uh, Tony Kelly, like I knew that I had to uh, I knew I had to make the cage small because he was doing a really good job of circling the fence. But, you know, I was only giving him two options going left or go right. He couldn't go back. You really even couldn't go forward because every time you try to go forward, I was stopping him with something. So. For me, it was just uh, with him, it was just more of like, okay, like I need to hit a hard point and stop him. Like I need to hit a hard point and stop him. That's why uh, I wasn't really going with the straight right hand. I was going with the hook and covering up with uh, going to the hooks a little bit more. Uh, that's why to me, whenever I look at the fight, it looks a little bit sloppy, but it was like kind of like a uh, switching up. Like that's also another reason why I wasn't even really trying to throw, like wasn't really throwing my jabs because like in that softball position, you kind of, 
crowded my left hand. So I'd had to kind of go around and start throwing the hooks, but mm. it was just mainly just like the footwork, honestly, like, cause you gotta, you gotta show them, like you have to dictate and actually show them that this is where you think they want to go. Uh, and you close that door immediately when that, when that happens, it's kind of hard to explain. I, it's just kind of just like, uh, it's super hard to ex- for me to explain because I just I've been doing it for so long uh, that it's just like I now I'm finally having to try to put it into words. I'm like, OK, well, uh, like a drill that I do, a drill that I would that I do is like I'll have someone ride the fence and like I'll make sure like I'm cutting that cage off and like throwing a strike off the off the uh, off the open side, off the side that I'm giving them. So it's just it's it's uh again, it's hard for me to explain, but I it's just my footwork just cutting 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 off and like making that so uh like off the fence like uh, when i have the back foot on the fence and they start moving i put myself in a, in a at an angle where like uh like almost like a triangle and they want to be like on the open side uh fuck i'm i'm probably fucking it up right now but no, no you're uh, explaining it just I, I get it totally you're good okay yeah uh, so, so that's so, that's that's so, how it goes so then in addition to that, well, you mentioned the stance switch. So for folks who may not remember the fight, you kind of pressured Rodriguez back to the fence. He wanted to escape to his right. Mm-hmm. You switched to Southpaw, blasted him with the head kick. What is your view on the value of stance switching? Because a lot of guys do it very differently. Not everyone has the same view of it. Some people do it through combinations. Some people just do it right in front of you. What do you, when you, if someone asks you, what is the value of stance switching for you? What would you say? Uh, the value of stand switching for me is, is man, like it's, it's very high up there, especially if you're looking to set something up. It, there's a lot of people who stand switch and don't really set anything up. If you're just one of those guys who's going to, uh, switch the stance and just do it for no reason. Like you have to have a rhyme or reason for, for, for you to even switch your stance. Cause uh, a lot of these guys, man, like, uh, actually, I can actually give you a really good example in, uh, uh, in my uh, second UFC fight, uh, Gustavo Lopez, he was doing the stance switches, but he was just trying to throw like a, he was throwing like a, I don't, I don't even really like he was switching stances and also trying to throw that that right hook or a right jab, uh, whichever one it was. But uh, I saw him doing that, so I really didn't even want to uh, like uh, entertain my switch. So I decided to stay orthodox for that whole entire fight because I didn't need I didn't need to go southpaw for that fight. Uh, and also he, I knew he kind of wanted to shoot in. So my, uh, sprawl is way better on the, on, on my orthodox side than the southpaw side, but, uh, him just in general, he was switching. And when he switched, it was just a switch of the feet. It wasn't like a angle cut while he switched. It was just like, he's here, he's here and then switches and just right here, the head stayed in the center the whole entire time. I am like, I'm one of those guys that sees that. And I'm just like, in that middle of the stance switch, you're going to be squared up. I just have to time you right and I'll catch you. And I really despise that whenever I, cause I train, I train guys, I coach guys. I was like, Hey, no, like if you're going to switch, I need you at least to start cutting off to your right. If you're going to, if you're the Orthodox guy and you, st- you switch stance, I need you start to move. I need you to move immediately because in that stance switch, like, that either that right hand that right hand is going to land every single time or the left hand whichever whichever uh side that they're uh whichever side that the other their opponent is dominant on that straight punch down the middle is going to catch you i need you moving your head can't be on the center line because if your head is on the center line you're going to get caught and that was a perfect example in that gustavo lopez fight he switched i just threw it straight down the middle and like i didn't really even had to throw any power behind that because he did it all for me. He switched stance also coming forward and it was just right there for me. So he pretty much like did all the work for me. I just had to throw the right hand. Uh, but no, like if you're going to switch a stance and yeah, I feel like you either had to use it to angle off or use it to set something up. I'm also, I'm a very big advocate of like, if, if I switch to South pole, I have to throw my left, I have to throw my left down hand immediately and then start working stuff off that power side or off that power kick. You know, if the other guy starts switching southpaw, uh, I got to throw my right hand or my right kick. So I have to make sure that I get them going to where I want them to go. So, uh, you know, stand switching, you just got to do it. You have, you have to have something. You absolutely have to have something you do off of it. Cause if you don't, you know, it's not good. It's not good. It's trash. 
What, what do you make of fainting? And in particular, you know, obviously it's become a lot more prevalent than it used to be. I could say when I first started covering MMA, it almost didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. Now you see a lot more of it. But like the master of it that I can see, or one of the guys I should say, who's very, very good at would be like Volkanovsky. And dude, he builds so many attacks off of it and so many combos and so many different. It's, it's impossible to tell what's coming and what's going. A, what do you make of the value of fainting in modern striking? And two, in particular, Volkanovsky's game. Man, uh, man, I, I am very impressed with Volkanovski and what he has done just in general. That that guy is just the absolute beast. He does, he does, he's going against guys who are taller than him. So that faint is that faint that he does is key because you can't like if you're just the guy who's just gonna throw overhand right every single time. You're the short guy. You're five. He's five six. He's been fighting people five nine, five ten, almost six foot people. You know, I guess the only time he fought someone close to his size is uh, Chad Mendes. But even then against someone like him, he was fainting. And someone who's as explosive as as uh, as Chad Mendes, you have to faint. You have to draw something out because if you don't draw something out, you know, and you're just kind of just like winging it, throwing overhands, or just like trying to uh, just trying to make something happen or, you know, whatever, you, you're going to get caught. And I am like a very bit big advocate of throwing a faint out there because you'll start seeing openings you throw a faint like it doesn't matter what it is like the guy is scared scared of your uh scared of your low kick like if jose aldo would have started actually like uh start uh fainting that low kick it would open up so much more you know it opened up so much more for him uh but someone like volkanovsky he does that he kind of does have like a hard step faint he'll step faint and then get somebody's reaction and then off of that, you build off of that. You build off of it. You build off of it. Just like even just someone like me, I I fainted on Tony Kelly. Like I fainted twice before I even shot in with a straight right uh, hook to the body and then another straight right. But like I was, it all started off just me off the faint because I started to get them to shell up and I started seeing the openings. And that's to me, whenever you start fainting, you start seeing all the holes like because you start seeing what they want to do, what they like. Uh, I'll faint the jab and be like, okay, well, faint the jab he's either going to cover up move or he's going to try to parry and depending on how they try to parry if they do like they're just one of those guys that push that does it wrong and push or swipe down it leaves so many more openings and i'm always telling fighters put something up it doesn't even matter like it doesn't even matter you can fake the right fake the left you can fake the foot jab you can fake the uh fake the low kicks just get something moving get them thinking because the more you get them to think a lot of these mma fighters they're not smart <laughs> like they're not smart at all they can't really uh they can't really tell like they that they're like being so fidgety and they start like you could faint the kick they're like oh shit or you faint the jab like oh gosh no like they they and you start make you start fain you start putting the feints in combos you're like you faint the kick you faint the jab then you come up with a straight right and a lot of these guys start getting like flustered because they're like, oh, I don't know what's coming. And then all of a sudden you just start building up on feints. You can actually do a whole combination and it all be a whole entire feint. And it's you'll start seeing everything kind of open. Like you'll throw, you can throw one, like a feint, a one, two, and you'll start seeing these guys, oh, they come up high and you're like, shit, the body's open, legs open. You can start building up off on top of it. And someone like Volk does that very perfectly. And like, mm. I, again, like he's going to need to do that again. He's going to need to do that. And that's a key to victory for him to go against someone like Max. Cause someone like Max, who's like very combo heavy, like you need to find the entry on Max. Cause if you, if you don't, he's going to pick you apart all day. If you were advising Max on what to do, and obviously, you know, Max is a very established credentialed uh, former champion and he's going to be in the hall of fame, but nevertheless, just curiously thinking about like the task at hand, what would be something, especially from the adjustments he made with a higher stance in the first fight, anticipating pressure in the second fight, um, what would you recommend would be something that would work against Volkanovski given the tool set of Max Holloway? I, I, we're just talking about it, man. We got to get the feints like that. Like I think, like I really think a, a good feint uh, offsets everybody, even another good fainter. Like you got someone who who's really good at feints, you throw a feint back, make them think. You have to make that that other person think as well. So, like if you if if I if if I'm throwing a lot of feints and the other guy's consistently thinking, I'm free to roam to do whatever I want. But the minute that that guy starts throwing feints at me, like he's feigning the left hook but comes with a straight right and clocks me, I'm like, oh shit! Now I have to start thinking about that. Like you gotta start, like especially at that high of a level. Yeah, it's mostly all thinking games because most of those guys aren't really getting any finishes anymore. Like it's like 
it's kind of hard to uh at, especially at that high level to continue to finish to finish guys because everybody's always like on top of the game they're mentally there and they're also very mentally smart uh the people i'm talking about that were that are kind of idiots you know are kind of like on the back end the <laughs> back end of the uc but uh <laughs> uh yeah no i i would be telling them like you need to start off with a faint uh give false starts like what i mean by a false start is act like you're gonna you're going to come forward, uh, act like you're going to come forward with the combination and then pull back. Like it's, uh, more of a, it, the guy who does it really well is like someone like TJ Dillashaw. He'll give like a, uh, mm. it's like, a, a TJ Dillashaw and Dominic who do a really good job of it. They act like they're going to come all the way forward. Then they pull themselves back. And that's why, like, that's a, there's a different thing, but I call that a fa- false type of start. And I would advise my, Max to do something like that. So you can get, Volkanovski thinking because if you don't have him thinking you don't have him thinking about anything he's gonna he's just gonna kind of run through you all right we we are short on time because I have uh, abused my time with you I could do this all day but the one thing I do want to end here with is I talk to a lot of coaches throughout the course of every year and every year I'm like what do you see as like the next big change what's the evolution of striking in particular in this case I, and I want to be clear everyone should know you have a well-rounded game but striking has been obviously your money maker so that's why I've been focusing on it but in terms of the striking you're 28 years old. I don't know where how you position yourself in terms of what's coming and what's going, but I guess what I would say is what's the next big growth development inside MMA striking that there may be parts of it now, but it's going to be much more pronounced, let's say in five years' time. What do you what do you think that is? Is it a particular skill, kind of certain weapon? What do you what do you imagine? Man, honestly, I think it would just be uh you're going to start seeing a lot more of these guys be really good boxers. I, I feel like, cause not a lot of these guys are using a lot of their head movements. A lot of these guys, like they don't, they don't faint. Like, I think uh, like uh, these high level guys are, are starting off, are starting to do the faints. They're, they're, they're being really good at fainting, but most of these guys coming up, they're not, they're not good at it. You know, the, the reason why I feel like I've had so much success because I started off fainting. Like I was immediately trying to make them think, uh, and for me, I feel like if we start getting these, if these guys on the come up start fainting a lot more, like, man, like it's literally the story of this interview is the faint. Like, hmm. I feel like, cause a lot of these guys don't do it enough. Like they don't do enough. They'll do it once they'll see that it works and then just kind of abandoning it. And like, I feel like if you get these guys that especially the lower level uh, and start coming up fainting, they start setting everything else up. Cause it's just one of those things that it's gonna, it's, it, it's gonna make, it a lot more interesting like at least on a technical level uh you know for for like fans that like love seeing like knockouts and like these these crazy things yeah you're still gonna have those couple knockouts but you're gonna start having these fighters just faint and there's gonna be a lot more of a thought process uh going uh going on but again i don't know how far how far that actually goes because again like a lot of these a lot of these fighters they just uh they're just not great when it comes to the striking aspect, they just like, they're just like, let me just throw this overhand. Right. Especially when you got the small gloves on, if I land it, it's going to knock them out. So some, some of these guys are still like that in this new, uh, especially on the come up, but there, it's, there's, there's, there's a lot of good guys coming up, especially uh, since I've been watching the regional scene uh, a lot. Like there's a lot of good guys coming up and a lot of these guys are, are showing a lot of promise. And even now these, these regional guys are like getting really fucking good to the point where like, man, some of these fights who, who are one and one and oh, two and oh, they're fighting, man. It's like a USC level type of fight. You know, you never would have got that four years ago. Now it shit, everybody's doing doing fucking phenomenal. So uh yeah, I would think it'd it'd be the faint and also the head movement will be better. I think a lot of people are still are are like for me, like even even now, like I'm like afraid of getting domed in the head with the kick. So that's why like I don't you don't utilize it too much mm. but i'll utilize it but like i'm always afraid of getting domed with the kick so I, like i kind of stayed like very like tight oh i will i i, I said i was gonna be my last question but i, I lied <laughs> this will be my last one this is kind of funny to me because again you you can take some stuff from boxing but to your point you got to be a little bit careful with how you slip and use your head movement you can get drilled it's not the same thing but i will tell you and this is true what i'm about to say is 100 true in mma 100 true in kickboxing any striking sport but it's like crazy pronounced in MMA the guys who can slip and counter versus the ones who have to block and move and again there, there's going to be the right sometimes blocking is going to be the right choice and sometimes moving is going to be the right choice but in general in MMA the guys who can slip and counter they have a devastating devastating difference level in terms of what they can do do you agree 
Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely, man. I got, I'll, I'll go back to uh, someone like uh, Israel Adesanya, like the champ at 185, man. He does a very phenomenal job. Like, uh, I think it was never he knocked out uh, Robert Whitaker on, I think he was on that, uh, the back, the back step moving his head. And I think he threw like a four, three, two or something like that. Like I, the one that, that, that initially stopped him and he just like, hurt him really bad that was off of head movement and the what punched my ticket into the ufc was me slipping the right and throwing the right and mm. coming back with the hook like so i yeah i completely agree like and and also too like it gives that it gives that fighter option to be like oh do i want to cover do i want to cover do I want, it gives them options and like the more options you have the more options that you're able to uh the more options that you have, you're going to be more success, more successful than just only having one option. Your go-to option is just to cover up. You know, the I, f- I feel like there's more pathways to victory when you slip. Because man, like you throw the guy throws a jab, you slip that jab, and you come back with a straight right. Man, they're going to be out of pos- they're, they're going to be out of position off the jab because they're missing you, and then you come back with a straight right. Man, a lot of times, a lot of these guys get knocked out. Man, fuck, uh, who who. Uh, man you see it in boxing all the time man all the time this just a just a slip and a quick counter it doesn't even have to be the hardest punch but you see a lot of these guys get dropped and so like i yeah i i completely agree with you like the head movement being the, the slips and everything just being like the key to victory for a lot of these guys who can do it you know because i again i'm one of I'm, i feel like i'm one of those guys as well no, you 100% are one of those guys, and I think it's only going to get better for you. You've had, let's see, you have your Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series fight, and then you have one, two, three, four, five. You've won them all. Dude, you're off to the races. So congratulations on your last win. If I see you in Vegas, I'll be sure to say hi. I'll be there next week as well. Um, all right, cool. Dude, you're, 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 you've, got, you've got a bright future ahead of you, so keep going, and thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Oh, man, thank you for being late. <laughs> thank you for being late, <laughs> but thank you for understanding. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure having uh, to, to be on, man. I, I'm a big fan. I whenever I was working, whenever I had a regular day job, I was listening to you and Brian Campbell on morning, on morning combat all the time. So yeah, I'm, I'm hundred percent. Uh, I'm a hundred percent like a, a fan. So this is we'll, cool for we'll, me. We'll get you in studio soon, man. We'll get you in oh, studio soon, but thank you okay. so much. Heal up. And we can't wait to see you in the octagon again. Thank you.